Welcome to the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth, and we're here to preserve and promote culture, one weekly conversation at a time. You can subscribe to the Virtual Memories Show through iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, Google Play, and a whole bunch of other venues. Just visit our sites, chimeraobscura.com slash vm or vmspod.com to find more information, along with our RSS feed. And follow the show on Twitter and Instagram at vmspod. Well, I'm a... Uh... I'm back from Michigan. I am getting ready for Barcelona. Um, That should be the last real business travel I do until next spring, Um, thankfully, Uh, although I might have the occasional Congress or or FDA visit to to make, but that's essentially train rides. So no more planes, except to visit my uh, in-laws during the holidays. But, um, oh, I also have a kind of inexplicable invitation to uh, a lunch with the chairman of the Federal Reserve in New York City this week, um, which I admit was so bizarre an opportunity that I I couldn't turn it down. Um, The invite specifies business elegant dress, which gives me some trepidation, um, mainly because my favorite suit, the one that would be absolutely perfect for this, is at the cleaner uh, until tomorrow. But, uh, you know, I'll I'll do my best. Now, um, as I've conveyed in recent episodes, work has uh, been pretty heavy, as in like defining my life uh, since this summer, especially. Um, in addition to planning, organizing, marketing, hosting my, my annual conference uh, a couple of weeks ago, I had some serious congressional lobbying slash advising to do, along with other industry meetings and all the, the day-to-day functions of my, my trade association. Um Speaking of which, I, I have to take care of October's invoices right, right after I wrap this up. And since we're two weeks into October at this point, I'm uh, slipping a little. But a pal of mine wrote me last week because uh, he was laughing over how my intro for one of the biggest shows I've ever done, the, the one with Dan Klaus, kicked off with me discussing that that annual conference and, and my pharma trade shows. And... Um, he marveled over the shifts between podcast gill and, and pharma gill. And I, um, I guess I do that partly to give you guys some idea of what goes into making the podcast. That is, you know, all the career stuff that I'll say gives me the resources to make this show and not just in terms of money, but, um, <laughs> the, time or the the lack of a certain type of stress that comes with, you know, earning decent money at at my day job, day career, Um, you know, it enables me to do this, although it creates its own level of stresses, as I've I've indicated. Um, And the balancing act to do it all is kind of what I try to get across, I guess, uh, in, in, you know, unspoken, well, uh, not overt ways when I talk about my day-to-day life here. Anyway, people still love the Klaus interview, so I'm glad I didn't turn anyone off, you know, talking about the uh, the PBOA annual meeting and conference. But anyway, let's get to this week's show. Um, we're going to celebrate spooky season. It is mid-October uh, for you, you time travelers who are listening to this at some other time. Um, we're going to celebrate spooky season with a conversation with Lisa Morton, who has a brand new book out now called The Art of the Zombie Movie. It's from Applause Books. Elisa and I recorded back in July at ReaderCon in, in Massachusetts, um, this literary science fiction, a fantasy festival, but we saved this for her pub date. Um, our mutual pal, Kate Mariama nudged us together. Um, and I'm awfully glad she did, even though we didn't get to talk about a bunch of things that Kate told me Elisa is an expert on, which we'll get to later. But I'll tell you, The Art of the Zombie Movie, it's uh, it's a visual history of the, the zombie flick. Sort of um, not quite coffee table size, but, you know, oversized hardcover book. Um, and it's got movie posters and, and stills and promotional photography and alternative art and and portraits and well it's a really neat package i only got to see it in pdf uh, because it was months before publication but it's just gorgeously laid out and it's also got these these wonderfully researched entertaining essays by lisa covering 
each era uh, of of the zombie movie and and sort of going into some of the key movies and key moments uh, in its history and 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 different cultures and niches takes on zombies um the kind of shifting cultural significance of it as as well as a zombie's grown into this this worldwide phenomenon um and she also even uses the the captions for the art to tell these really great stories and give these little anecdotes in in just perfectly concise bursts uh to give the reader even more context for for this form and how it's evolved and and what some of the um the lack of expectations going into some of these projects and the unforgettable art they created uh, sort of all comes out in the, the process of, of her writing and all the, uh, you know, all the visual pieces that accompany it. Uh, plus, she writes these great profiles of, of key figures like George Romero and, and uh, Bela Lugosi and, and Vincent Price and, and Vampira and Tom Savini. Some of them are like full size profiles. Other ones are just, you know, part of a page. But. But there's lots of these things that, you know, sort of go into the personalities and the people who who helped advance the form over the years. And she combines like really flowing prose with solid research and such a love of this genre that, you know, every page is just a blast. So I enjoyed the heck out of it. And I say that as someone who only has a sparse interaction with with the zombie genre, uh, because as we get into in this episode, for me, zombies sort of conflate with this implacable mass mind fascism thing. And well, given my family history with, with Nazi Germany and, um, and living in countries near theirs, as, as my deceased family members did, it, uh, well, it makes zombies kind of a weird thing for me. And when they show up in a nightmare, it's, um, usually tied to that, that kind of, kind of thing so that's my own damn hang up that said Shaun of the Dead is one of my favorite movies of the century um, and as a Danny Boyle fan I saw 28 Days Later when it opened although technically not a zombie movie as, as we talk about um, I recognize Night of the Living Dead as amazing filmmaking and and I laughed and cried over Reanimator or laughed and cringed over Reanimator uh, when I, I saw that back in high school. Oh, and I love the novel of World War Z by uh, Max Brooks. Saw some of the movie, didn't like the fast zombie side of it. Think the the book was more um, more thoughtful in a lot of ways. Anyway, Lisa's writing is awfully illuminating and and entertaining, and the art that she chooses for the book is just fantastic. So. It being Halloween season, um, you ought to go check out the Art of the Zombie movie and fire up some of your fave zombie flicks on, on TV. And at Lisa's advice, I will finally get around to watching Train to Busan, maybe on the, the flight to Barcelona this weekend, so that I don't sleep the entire time. Anyway, here's Lisa's bio from her site, lisamorton.com. Lisa Morton is a screenwriter, author of nonfiction books, and prose writer whose work was described by the American Library Association's Reader's Advisory Guide to Horror as, quote, consistently dark, unsettling, and frightening. She is a six-time winner of the Bram Stoker Award, the author of four novels and over 150 short stories, and a world-class Halloween and paranormal expert. That's the part I didn't get to talk about with her back in July, and I'm kicking myself that we didn't get to, but... That's up for the next conversation. Her latest releases include Calling the Spirits, A History of Seances, and The Art of the Zombie Movie. Recent short stories appeared in Best American Mystery Stories 2020, Final Cuts, New Tales of Hollywood Horror and Other Spectacles, and Classic Monsters Unleashed. Lisa lives in Los Angeles. And now, the Virtual Memories Conversation with Lisa Morton. So I guess just to start, if you could tell me where the book began for you, the the art of the... Well, yeah, tell me the title, too, because I'm going to get it wrong since I don't have it in front of me right it now. It is The Art of the Zombie Movie. Yeah. Um, I was truthfully brought in as a hired gun on this one. Mm-hmm. Um, I have done some work with an interesting company out of Britain called Elephant Books, and they call themselves a book packager rather than 
yeah. distinctly a <laughs> publisher or an agent. Yeah, you look like you know. And one of the things that they specialize in is putting together big coffee table art books that they sell as a whole package to a publisher. And um, they did that with the British author and editor Stephen Jones, who is a friend of mine. And um, they did three volumes with him called The Art of Horror, The Art of uh, Horror Movies, and The Art of um, Pulp Horror. And I actually had contributed to all three of those volumes. And so they were looking for somebody to do one called The Art of the Zombie Movie, which apparently they kind of pre-sold just on the basis of zombies and all that. And they came to me and they said, would you be interested in doing this? And I said, I would actually love to do that, partly <laughs> because I've always loved zombies. Um, one of the movies that totally effed me up at a very young age was Dawn of the Dead. Um, and partly because I have secretly always wanted to do a big coffee table art book of my own. And um, they originally were saying to me, do you want to do it like we do the books with Steve, where um, he assembles contributors who write each different chapter? And I said, I actually would like to do the whole thing on my own. <laughs> um, and fortunately for me, they were cool with that. And Did you know what you were getting yourself into? Um, yes and no. <laughs> um, I certainly had no problem with the text. Um, it was really fun to research not just the history of zombie movies, but kind of the, the history of zombies in folklore mm -hmm. and in, um, Haitian beliefs and so forth. That was really interesting. Um, and I learned a lot of stuff I didn't know. And then following it through with some of the movies that I had somehow missed and caught up on was great. But what was really interesting with doing a big coffee table art book was assembling the illustrations because that was up to me as the author. Um, and the book has 500 illustrations. And one of the things I knew I wanted to do with it right from the start was not like the usual collection of old movie posters, which everybody does, and which is great. But I wanted it to be as hip as possible. And because there is a gigantic scene right now in alternative movie posters, yeah. and I love these things, and I wanted to include as much of that contemporary art as I could. And um, and again, I was lucky they all were down with that idea. And, um, so I just spent months and months and months and months digging through endless, you know, websites and art books and people's personal collections and all kinds of things looking for that perfect combination of like old vintage yeah. images and the new stuff. And, um, one of the good things is that the author at least does not have to clear the copyright on everything. They have people dedicated to doing just that. So obviously, um, a certain amount of my first choices got kicked back either because they couldn't clear them or they weren't technically good enough or whatever. Um, I think I gave them like 700 images and we did end up with about 500 out of that. They may have kicked back even an extra 50 of mine and then they suggested a few that they liked as well. So, um, and in the end, I'm really happy with how it turned out. I think it's a really cool looking book. Yeah, it was. And again, I've only done it as a PDF, but on a big screen. I, right. I, I, I was like, I could put it on my lap. No, I'm putting it on the, the monitor, oh, the, nice. the, the 32 I inch, so I can look it at way. it, it spreads and all this. Uh, yeah, it's, it's gorgeous. And that's what struck me at the beginning, thinking it was going to be the vintage art right. by itself and seeing yeah. things like, ah, that, that is not drawn the way, okay, the, these are contemporary pieces. And of course... You get to get Drew Friedman in yeah, there, right. which is always important to me. Drew, <laughs> Drew's been on the show multiple times, and I've, oh, I've wow. gone to visit out in his, uh, his place in Pennsylvania. Um, and I always send around to a, a pal of mine from college one of his Tor Johnson uh, drawings oh, every yeah. so often. That's just a Tor need work, you know, just, just <laughs> send it over to my, my friend as a occasional reminder of, of our 90s days. Um, but, yeah, that notion of... of Making it contemporary, even for things that were, again, like 1932 or so, yeah. and, and, you know, trying to, to balance those things, I thought makes it really graphically vibrant. Uh, how much were you involved in the, um, uh, I assume I had designer designers going on, but still, yeah. when you were looking for some of these things, you know, how much of it was a, how much were you looking with a designer's eye, I guess, uh, when you were compiling some of the images? A, a fair amount. Um, and I... 
had a little bit of final say in the layout. I mean, again, obviously, they're very good at doing these books, and so they have incredible layout yeah. artists. And um, and I had a really great layout artist. I also had a really good editor who's very experienced at these books. And um, we would occasionally talk about, oh, wait, you know, move that one to that yeah. corner or move that one to that page and um until we were all happy with the way everything coordinated and and there were actually a few times i think when i would be looking at some older vintage poster and thinking oh i wish i had blah 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 to go with that and then we'd find like the perfect thing to juxtapose against it and um so i was a little bit conscious of that right from the start i think yeah it seems for something like this that you're you're balancing that that writerly eye with the as you said the coffee table yeah. mentality wanting to to have your name on something like that um was dawn of the dead your first zombie movie or do you I have something that predates it? So, um, the only thing I might have seen, and I mean, I was very young. I think I was probably. Too young. It, it's usually too young yeah. when we first encounter this, but go. <laughs> I saw it on opening night in a theater. Um, I was a film student, I was probably 18 at the time, and I had no idea what I was in for. Somehow I had never seen Night of the Living Dead. I don't know how I missed it all the years it screened endlessly on television, even from... Yeah, I was um, assuming you saw yeah. Dawn of the Dead on, on cable yeah, in, on, you know, which Saturday I afternoon or something. somehow did not. The only things I might have seen before Dawn of the Dead would have been the much simpler, less graphic things. Like, I probably had seen White Zombie. Um, I probably had seen the Hammer film Plague of the Zombies. But, yeah, in terms of, like, the modern, hardcore, ultra-violent, flesh-eating zombie, that was the first one. And I think I was, like, sleepless for about three nights <laughs> afterwards. I, it just smacked me upside the head with a combination of dear God, that was horrifying. And oh my God, that was really cool, you know? And, um, after that, I, I just couldn't kind of stop thinking about zombies. And I was, um, I've written a fair amount of zombie fiction too. And, yeah. um, like the first piece of zombie fiction I wrote was for the third volume of the Skip Inspector, um, series that started with Book of the Dead, which was an anthology of zombie, mo uh, zombie fiction that was very seminal and that I absolutely loved. And, um, I was dying to be, no pun intended, dying to be in one of those books. And so I did get into the third one that Skip Alone edited, which ended up taking 11 years to get published, I think, and um, came out finally under the title Mondo Zombie. And since then, I've written a lot of zombie fiction. So, yes, I've always loved these things. <laughs> Have you, I will say, analyzed what it means to you? Oh, you mentioned I've... the conformity aspect, you know, that they represent a sort of... Yeah, Overwhelming, but, but on I mean, a I thought level. a lot about it because of the way Dawn of the Dead impacted me. It's yeah. like, what what was it about that, that that so got to me? And I think it is this idea that um, there is no no elegance or glamour or anything in death that you are just reduced to a walking um, thing like everyone else. I think one of the important things about the modern zombie conception, the post-Romero, is the horde. Yeah. It isn't yeah. just the single thing that's shambling along looking to eat people. It's the idea of the faceless horde that right. just shambles together. And I think that was a large part of it for me. Yeah. On a going into Gil's dreams thing, um, my family's Holocaust history, I think, ah, tinges the, the, the zombie thing. It's that sure. sense of, yeah, this is an implacable, I can't escape, the entire world is against us thing. Yeah. That, as Jews with Eastern European heritage, that's somehow conflated with zombies in my, my subconscious. So I'm glad that's not your thing exactly. So that's, that's <laughs> right. Not, but where did horror begin for you as a genre? Very young. Um, I mean, I was, I always say I was one of those weird little girls who wanted to be a monster and not a princess at Halloween. <laughs> um, I, yeah, do you ever dream you're the zombie? Uh, I don't know that I've ever dreamed I was the zombie. Okay, just, yeah. just wondering. Yeah. Um, I think I have had many nightmares in which... You know, they're they're coming after me kind of thing. But, they're coming um, to get you. Oh, sorry, go on. Yeah, <laughs> they haven't gotten me yet. Um, yeah, but as a kid, I loved 
horror movies. I had very indulgent parents who loved horror movies, and uh, my mom and I would stay up late and watch whatever, you know, back in the day when they had three channels yeah. on television, and you would hope they would run something good and scary on them. And um, and then my dad and I would make Aurora monster models, you know, and all that kind of thing. So they were, they were cool with it, and I always loved it. And then um, even given that, I grew up reading mainly science fiction, uh, but then it all changed for me when I was 15 and saw The Exorcist. And um, <laughs> it's really hard now to describe what that was like in 1974. It was released at the end of 73. I saw it about a month or so after it was first released. So it was early 74. And I was 15. And um, that movie absolutely devastated audiences yeah. back then. I, there hasn't been a movie like that since. So I think young people probably just kind of laugh at, you know, oh, they're exaggerating or something. That movie was insane. I mean, people ran out of the theater screaming and they were passing out and they're vomiting and they're, you know, and then you would go into like a restaurant and you would see... Um, a waitress who just looked horrible and you'd say, oh my God, are you okay? And she'd be like, oh, I haven't slept since I saw The Exorcist two weeks ago. <laughs> I mean, the, the impact this movie had on people was absolutely astonishing. And and when I first saw it, I knew that was what I had to do. I um, Up until then, I the, all of my counselors and everything were steering me into the sciences. I tested really well on that kind of thing. Um, and I remember how horrified they all were when <laughs> I came back from seeing this movie and was like, no, I want to write movies now. I want to write. And they were like, you can't do that. Yeah. No, you're going into yeah. anthropology. Let's do math and yeah. science. Yeah. 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 The only thing remotely comparable, I had friends who, um, they were critics or, or movie reviewers who uh, went to the uh, screenings of the Blair Witch Project I was say, with yeah. no explanation whatsoever. Like they seriously did not know it was yeah fake. They right. just came in with, "So what are we watching?" And, and this was the movie, and it was, oh my god! But yeah, again, within a couple of weeks, everybody knew yeah. what it was, so it didn't have that effect. But I can't think of anything else that. Exactly. Culturally, you know, just yeah. just annihilated people like yeah. that. So. No, there hasn't been one. I'm not sure if there could be one. No. anymore either so what do you think that is jadedness or yeah i think i think the exorcist may have sort of sundered those last yeah. <laughs> <laughs> gentle bonds that we had with religion and um a lot of our sort of commonly held beliefs and i just i don't know that there's anything left to smack you anymore the way that one did mm -hmm. so and when it comes to the writing slow zombies Oh yeah. Okay. Oh totally. <laughs> no, I mean, you, you 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 don't editorialize specifically between fast or slow in the book. I mean, at least you, you come out even on it. But I, you know, deep yeah. down, you're you're a slow zombie person. I totally right? am slow. And yeah. do we count twenty eight days later or not? Uh, I mean, I, you do in the book, but you a caveat it. But, I think you know. of it as zombie adjacent, okay. um, which is how I think of a few of the films that are very close and have been inspirational on other zombie movies, but yeah. are technically not zombies. I, One of the things I think you probably may have seen in the book is that I am try to be very clear in the definition of a zombie. And I think the definition, weirdly enough, I believe can apply to both the pre-Romero zombie, which was usually a thing controlled by a voodoo master somewhere and it was a single person or maybe there'd be a handful of them who served a master and they were slow and they were they were completely non-intelligent and would just do simple tasks i actually believe that is the same monster as the romero zombie because they're all things that have been resurrected from the dead without any purpose or intelligence and they are controlled by something else in the case of the old ones like white zombie and i walked with a zombie they're controlled by an actual person in the case of the post romero they're controlled by their hunger so do you remember your Night of the Living Dead experience? Uh, by the time I actually got to Night of the Living Dead, I had already seen a lot of the really hardcore things. I yeah. think I had I had obviously seen Dawn of the Dead. I may have seen a few Fulchies. Um I think I probably first saw Night of the Living Dead somewhere right around, maybe not even all that long 
before or after I saw Dawn, uh, Day of the Dead from 1985. So it wasn't until like the mid 80s that I saw it. And of course, by then it was like, oh, it's pretty amazing. But yeah, I that, mean, I've seen the that's really... that balancing act of, you know, for what it was, for when it was. Yeah. This is fantastic. And then, yeah, I've also incorporated everything that's come since then. So. I, have, I have come to appreciate Night much more in just the last few years, yep. really. Um, when you study the making of it, and um, how they put it together, and and almost some of the accidental genius I think on display in that movie is when you really start to appreciate just what an incredible, complete milestone that that movie was. Yeah, what did you, what did you learn in the process of putting this together? Um, because there's a lot of research for there is you know, a coffee lot of table research. book zombies, etc. But you you put a lot of work into this. The so. the biggest thing that I think surprised me was how recent even the voodoo type zombie is. Um, it it really doesn't come into popular consciousness until 1929. Mm-hmm. Um, I think many people may have the same idea I did, which was that it was something that was well-known before that, maybe through the travels or journals or something of people going to the Caribbean. And it wasn't. It There are, I mean, what you can find before 1929 are a few occasional sort of offhanded mentions. Oh, they believe this strange thing down there. And then you get to 29 and you get to this writer named William Seabrook, who was an interesting guy. He was... A world traveler, he was obsessed with the occult. Wherever he went, he tried to learn the uh, local occult beliefs and and actually sort of enroll himself in them. And um, he spent a couple of years in Haiti. And while he was down there, he got to know some of the locals and he learned about zombies. And one entire, so in 29, he puts out a book called The Magic Island, and one entire chapter is about zombies. And it's absolutely fascinating. And and when you read it, um, you learn things about zombie lore you didn't know. I didn't know, for example, that in the traditional belief, they must be fed. They eat only very um, mild things like gruel is something (laughs) they're supposed to eat. If you give them salt or meat, it supposedly awakens their consciousness. And they, at that point, will stagger back to, like, their native village and dig themselves a grave, that (laughs) kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah, Um, So, yeah, there were some interesting traditional beliefs I learned a a lot about. And um, obviously, I know that voodoo and so forth are the correct pronunciations of these things. I tend to refer to the old voodoo just because so many of the movies I studied were... (laughs) This this weekend at ReaderCon, I've, I've... I've heard how Lovecraft actually pronounced Cthulhu uh, from, from Henry Wessels. Apparently, it's Kulu. Which, really? Okay. Yeah, see, everybody's had the same reaction. <laughs> and he, he said this during a reading, and first question was, how are you pronouncing that again? And he said, it, it's in one of Lovecraft's letters. I, I can't quote uh-huh. it here, but that's how we pronounce it. And then everybody's like, huh. I always thought it was Cthulhu. Okay. And, right. and so, yeah, we, we all now have to change our our, okay. our thing. So, yeah, it can be pretty educational getting uh, deeper and deeper into horror. Yeah. But, you know. uh, how did the how did this work uh, influence or affect your, your fiction since then? Um, that's interesting. I Are you incorporating anything you've, you've picked up on through this? I'm trying to think if I... I don't believe I, don't I have time. written anything related to zombies since. Um, Truthfully, I'm not sure I have done a lot of fiction in the last year. This book was only finished um, at the beginning of this year. So I was working on this. This took up almost all of my 2022. And we were still working on it, I think, up through March of this year, doing the final passes and layouts. And there were even those few um, pieces that we all absolutely loved that took forever to clear that finally didn't clear and we oh. were heartbroken to lose them. I and was going to ask if you had a holy grail, either something <sighs> you were always looking for or something you just couldn't get in. There was yeah. one we just couldn't get in, which I love so much. It's a, it's a modern alternative poster um, for Dawn of the Dead and it, um, it, it it's an incredible piece that we just couldn't clear quite in time, and I ended up buying myself a poster of it. <laughs> um, so, I, there, yeah, there were a few of those things that you're like, oh, I really, really, really wanted to use that, but oh well. 
Um, fortunately, we almost always found things that we loved just as much. And um, in the case of the Dawn of the Dead piece, um, we did end up getting other pieces by that artist. So I was happy to have those in there. And I won't say the artist who it is. No. So um, yeah, you know. I understand. Yeah. <laughs> that, that's usually something that, that comes up with the not wanting to burn any bridges here yeah, on the right, show. Exactly. Well, you know. Are you much of a collector? A little your, bit, your yeah, yeah. Not a. I wouldn't call myself a super collector. I mean, I know nobody people, ever calls themselves a super yeah. collector. It's everybody who knows them who. Oh, but sorry, go on. <laughs> I do. I do have a few things that I just love. I I had a few pieces from Dawn of the Dead um, uh, and uh, Day of the Dead that I w actually ended up using in the book. And then I did buy a few uh, pieces recently to use in the book. Um, there's a really interesting um, seminal British film, um, uh, Dr. Blood, that um, I ended up getting like some nice lobby cards <laughs> from that we scanned for the book. And um, so, yeah, I was, I have a small collection, but there were fun, some fun things from that, that we pulled in. Mm -hmm. Approaching this project coming out of the, well, we'll say coming out of the pandemic, yeah. even though we're all still in the pandemic. Um, what was the, yeah, I guess, mentality or, or how do you, how do you uh, contrast, you know, <laughs> pandemic life and, and, you know, zombie mythology and, and that mentality? I, I think like many of us horror loving people, when we went into lockdown in March of 2020, I think one of the first things that crossed my mind was, damn it, we don't even have zombies to shoot. <laughs> yeah. I, mean, we... <laughs> I made Night of the Comet references repeatedly in go. those early yeah, days. Exactly. Yeah. Um, it just somehow, I, I it felt weaker and stranger to not have an obvious thing you could fight you yeah. know i you're in this this situation where you're locked into your house and you don't know how long it's going to go on and you don't know at the, in the beginning it was strange because none of us really knew the facts about this this virus yeah. we thought it would kill us instantly or something you know if we got it so um but you couldn't see it you couldn't and we thought it was it was by hand as opposed right, to, to breathing yes. because you could touch a surface and you would die instantly. We're you know, washing our, of... our our groceries and yeah. keeping them in the garage for for an extra day or two before bringing them in the house. That was right. Uh, yeah. yeah, and um, you know, I think in in a situation like that, you almost be, come to envy <laughs> yeah. the the zombie thing where you've got an obvious enemy out there and you know how to deal with it, even though there there are many of them and they're implacable. It still gave you some something clear, you know, whereas the, the sort of, plus, even as we got farther along in that, and we were um, more aware of what this virus was as the time went on, um, I mean, I don't know, I was, I think, in lockdown for about two months before I went back to my job. I, I have a day job I absolutely love as a bookseller. And there was that whole thing about, am I going to have my job to go back to? What if I don't? What if, because obviously, is a bookstore going to make it after being closed for two months, you know? And um, it's a used bookstore in Los Angeles, so um, it's obviously not a high-profit enterprise to begin with. Yeah. And there was, so there was just all that additional uncertainty about it. And it was... Um, People don't worry about unemployment in zombie movies. You, yeah, you notice exactly that. That's right. A, you know, yeah. Except in Shaun of the Dead, where they ended up using them to like, work in, in Walmart and everything, which I'm sure has been used in other, other zombie yes. flicks. My own experience is relatively scant with, with the movies. But, but yeah, it's, um, you know, we had that mentality of the guys who refuse to believe it's going on. They're going to go out of the house and, and you know, confront it. <laughs> it, it. We seem to get a, a good mirroring of that over the, the, the first couple of years of this, too. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Things are a little... Uh, little weird, but uh, no, no, uh, our mutual pal Kate asked me uh, or told me that, you know, you did a good amount of research uh, in Pittsburgh for the, the George Romero papers. Yeah. Um, and that, you know, they're, they're also picking up your papers, I think. Uh, they uh, have indeed. Yeah. And turning that into the, the, the horror center. Um, what do you find? What, what, what's in the, the George Romero papers? What sorts of things really they were fabulous. Um, I cannot sing the praises enough of the University of Pittsburgh's special collection. Um, I worked with two of their archivists there. The main one is Ben Rubin, and the other one is a fellow named Adam Hart, who was a professor at 
uh, the U University of Pittsburgh. I think he's since moved, but um, they were both very helpful. And uh, by the way, I will plug a, a forthcoming book that Adam has coming out, which I have read called Raising the Dead. And it's about his everything he found archiving the Romero um, yeah. papers, which was over 100 boxes of material because George was very prolific and kept everything. Um, and Adam's books contained some astonishing revelations, like the existence of an entire feature film George made before Night of the Living Dead, hmm. um, which does not, they have nothing of it now except like one reel, unfortunately, but uh, a thing called expostulations. <laughs> um, yeah. Anyways, I found... Um, I looking at and this is something by the way they have scanned it online and anyone can go look at this they have George's working script for Night of the Living Dead and it's very interesting to look at um it's just covered from beginning to end with his notes and many of the notes are the production things the blocking all that kind of thing but there are also these endless little notes scribbled in the margins about things like um, get Bob to go pick up entrails from Butcher for next <laughs> tomorrow's shoot, you know, and you're just like, wow, I mean, the amount of DIY stuff he was doing, everything was just, hey, get him to go over and get the helicopter for the shoot. It, it It's such an interesting look at how one of the most important horror movies of all time was just made with a gang of friends, you yeah. know, and guys who were just pulling in favors and and then you see uh, the the lead character in the script is not Ben. It's called Truck Driver. And it was a guy who's like a backwoods truck driver. Then they go out and they do the casting sessions. And the best guy they see is this fantastic actor named Dwayne Jones, who comes in and looks at the script and goes, you know, George, I'm not really a truck driver yeah, type. I, I, I can play certain things. But, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's just not me. So they rewrite the dialogue for him. But, and yet the name in the script remains truck driver. You know, that was yeah. really interesting to see how they actually recrafted the lead of their movie to fit this talented actor. Um, it was just such an interesting look at how, like I said, one of the, the great horror movies of all time was crafted, much of it kind of on the fly, and just this incredible work of art. They had no clue of the significance of what they were no doing, clue right? I mean, because it really was lightning in a bottle. Uh, it sure it was, seemed, yeah. yeah. And, um, you know, the, of course, the horrible tragedy with the copyright <laughs> thing, and um, so they... They didn't actually put a date on the movie? They and, didn't and, put a copyright notice on the movie when they changed the title. And so within a few years, every TV, you know, station in the the world has realized, hey, we can run this movie for free. And um, George loses all of that money. And fortunately, he makes it back with Dawn of the Dead. Mm -hmm. But, yeah. What did you find? I guess, you know, one of the interesting things to me in the book is the geographic spread, not just <laughs> the like American movies being shown in, yeah. in other regions and the way that the art changes for some of those. But the way the zombie myth, you know, crops up, especially the Italians who are nuts. Right. But, you know, what did you really find, you know, in terms of, of that sort of geographic spread? And is there a country whose zombie movies you sort of put above everybody else's? Uh, um, I, yeah, I, that was one of the things that I really wanted to do right from the beginning was show the global spread of these yeah. zombie pictures. And um I am a huge fan of one from Hong Kong in the 90s called BioZombie. Um, that's long been a favorite of mine. So the um, I have kind of a fondness anyways for Hong Kong cinema. That That's one that I always send people to go look at. Go, go find BioZombie and watch it. It's so fun. Um, I was hoping to find a lot more from Africa because I know the Nigerian film industry is booming and um, I think it's entirely possible there are more um, from there. I only found a handful, which I do cover in the book. And um, 
I haven't, and truthfully, I haven't seen any of them because I couldn't find them. I'm sure, it's got to be real difficult. Uh, Nobody's it, streaming. It uh, does, these and, sorts and of there things. are so many great DVD companies now doing these remarkable box sets from all over the world, and I just cross my fingers that somebody will get out there and find these films and do yeah. a box set of them because they look fantastic. This could be a side career for you, <laughs> not that you necessarily want to go traveling around trying to, to secure rights to all these things. Right. But, you know. <laughs> As you mentioned working in a used bookstore in L.A., yeah. tell me a little about, well, A, your Los Angeles, and B, literary L.A., you know, what it means to you. It, uh, uh, I am a lifelong California native, um, uh, born and, and raised there. I've lived my whole life in California. There was one year in Northern California and a few years in San Diego, otherwise it's all been L.A. And I always think L.A. gets a bad rap quite often in literary circles. Um, I think that is fading, thank goodness. But for many years, there was this sort of New York attitude that L.A. was nothing but people looking to get a tan and lay on the beach and read self-improvement books, you know. And um, we have a huge and thriving literary community there that is so exciting to be a part of. Uh, when I was first... Um, getting into fiction writing, which was kind of back in the 80s, because I wasted way too many years on screenwriting, as a lot of people in LA <laughs> do. Um, we had what they called the California Sorcerers were still around, which was the group that had been sort of founded with uh, Ray Bradbury and Charles Beaumont and William F. Nolan and um, these amazing writers who were many of them still around at that time in the 80s. And kind of one of their offspring was a guy named Dennis Etchison. And Dennis Etchison turned out to be not just my favorite writer in terms of horror, but also um, a mentor to me. And I was so fortunate to have that. And um, with Dennis was very close to all of these people. And I mean, it's the kind of thing where you're like a 22-year-old and you're realizing, oh, my God, Ray Bradbury is in the back of my car right now, you know, and um, because Ray didn't drive. And we would often drive Ray around to things, Dennis and I. And um, then later on, I was fortunate to drive Dennis to things even um, towards the end of his life. And um, so we have this wonderful community, especially of speculative fiction people. But there are so many writers who I love in L.A. Um, one of my favorites is a guy named Steve Eric who I oh, just gosh. think is yeah. one of the great American novelists. He's not as well known as he should be. He is a local L.A. guy. Um, so, and is it you know, we'll say L.A. native or Southern California native, as opposed to people coming in that you, you find it in seems the scene? to be. Um, I know. I. Th I think Erickson is a native. Dennis was. Um, Bradbury, of course, was not, but many of them were and are. And um, I think there is a sort of almost distinctive version of L.A. that many of us put into our books. I, um, I know I love to write about L.A. It's become my fiction go-to for a setting and um, because I think it's a much more interesting place than people give it credit for. It's way darker. <laughs> <laughs> um, it It's sort of bad rep of being light and airy and goofy and people into health food or whatever, you know, is um, belies its history as a place that has repeatedly replaced different peoples. Um, and sort of laid siege to them and then turned them into ghosts that haunt the land. And um, it's just a really interesting... I, I love all of the, the local ghost stories about L.A., and there are many more than people realize. And they're not just Hollywood. I mean, they're things that go back to the early Californios and um, coming in in the 19th century stuff. There are some really strange stories out there. And mm -hmm. Yeah, I... I... Recorded with a, a musician, a songwriter, pal, uh, uh, David Bayerwald, who used to live in uh, where OJ lived up in the... the those, oh, Brentwood. Brentwood, yeah. yeah. Uh, again, this is... My 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 L.A. consists of Gil <laughs> drives to different people's homes, records with them, and then gets on a train to San Diego for a biotech conference. This is like the only, the only uh, Los Angeles I ever get. But uh, his his take was that only the bus drivers 
know LA because they're the ones who actually see ah right you know, every neighborhood. Yeah, uh, but says it's very much a, a city of neighborhoods. It is yes, you know. exactly. There, there's a wonderful Steve Erickson book where um, each neighborhood has its own time zone, and I, I thought that was so accurate. <laughs> it's a great and metaphor weird, for what it's like. Yes, exactly. <laughs> it was weird for me the very first time I had. Uh, again, Brentwood, and then off to Malibu to record with someone, and it was just the, I don't know anything about the geography here, but I'm used to cities having cities in them, like, you know, just yeah. a big bunch of towers, and this is what you do. I'm like, this is really not giving me that. This is just spreading out in every direction. It and, is very spread out. Uh, I love all of those little diverse nooks yeah. and neighborhoods, and um, I actually live right now up in the uh, northern end of the San Fernando Valley, so yeah, I guess I'm a valley girl, but <laughs> even just within that area and people tend to think of the valley as being just this sort of homogenous home of porn you know and it, it's like but it's I more am, than that i'm just kidding go on it yeah. is yeah, yeah, yeah it's well it is that too but um i'm wedged in between like a an armenian community that's really interesting and um you go a little bit farther to one side and you get um like a, a little enclave of people who come from the south and bring traditional barbecue with them and just all, you know, and then obviously you go over the hill and you get Koreatown and Thai town. And Kate and I recently went out for dinner and we were like, oh, let's go to Senam Lung, which is the, this incredible Thai restaurant that's just a little hole in the wall on Hollywood Boulevard. You know, I just, I love the diversity of the city. I always have. It's, um, again, just from my scant running around from place to place, it's a <laughs> a, a, a patchwork of things. It doesn't it really is. add up. So I'm sure <laughs> actually getting to experience it and live in it is a very different thing than, you know. Yeah. yeah. Uh, being in a car is uh, necessary, but it's also, you know, damaging to, to actually just getting out and, and seeing a place. Right, but, right. But yeah, I'll have to make it's, it. A, you cannot walk L.A. <laughs> yeah. yeah, although Kate says she has a tour she has to take me on, so I'm not sure if it's a walking tour or okay. or, or not, but she's got a, a whole thing. Next time you're out here, you know, we'll, we'll get together and she's got some... Oh, I'll have to ask her what it is. Yes, it, it ends at the last bookstore, but, you know, oh, okay, there's, there's a whole lot okay. there. okay, okay. Which she also kind of... Yeah. Yeah. Okay, bookstore. But, yeah, you know. exactly. It, it's a beautiful space. Yeah. Um, they have done some really clever, arty things with the books, which mm -hmm. is fun. Um, I like to think that my store, which is the Iliad Bookshop in North Hollywood, uh, has a little bit more of a curated selection of books. Mm -hmm. I mean, we look like a junkie used bookstore like all the rest of them, but I think our selection is really good. Hmm. What's the what's the root of calling it the Iliad? Um, I have actually, hmm. I should clarify that I've worked there for about 30 years. I don't own it. But oh. when it was started in uh, 86, it was located next to a thing called Odyssey Video. That would do it. So <laughs> Yeah, exactly. I know. And then unfortunately, Odyssey being a video store went under and we moved about a mile and a half away. So the name has lost lost a little of its significance and people often think we're like a classics Greek. or something yeah, yeah. exactly <laughs> so tell me you know we're here at reader con this will air a few months after that but you're also deeply involved in stoker con indeed okay tell me about the the show i've never been and i tend to do comics festivals as opposed to, to literary but you know this uh, reader con is my my thing um, tell me about Stoker Con and your your involvement in it. Well, first you must come. <laughs> is it always in um, Pittsburgh or is it? No, a, it's it in a different city every okay. year. Yeah. Um, it started in 2016. Mm -hmm. um, at the time that it started, I was the president of the Horror Writers Association, and I was actually one of about well, really two people who kind of invented Stoker Con. Um, the president before I stepped into office was a fellow named Rocky Wood, and um, I was his vice president. And, and together we had been running things that were almost conventions. We, had, we would put together these weekends surrounding the presentation of our Bram Stoker Awards, or we would put, put on one of the world horror conventions for the group that did those. And we finally... Um, we're getting uh, the organization was growing and a lot of our members were coming to us and saying why don't we just do our own convention 
We could and, put on a show. Yeah, Sorry, exactly. That's a and, and to Rocky you. and yeah. I talked about it, and and we said, you know what? That's good because we saw things we wanted to do differently from the shows we were running for other people quite often, and um, we wanted more of an emphasis on like education and networking and business for writers. And so we started seriously putting it together, I think, in about 2014. Um, and then Rocky sadly died at the end of 2014, and I had to step in as president. And um, the first Stoker Con took so much planning it that it happened in, finally in 2016 in Vegas, which was a mistake. Take maybe. Vegas, <laughs> New Orleans, and Hawaii always seem like they, and I, I say yeah. this from a pharmaceutical show perspective, seem like they'd be great places. They're not great places. They're not great Nobody places. Nobody actually goes to the event itself. They just, I'm in Vegas. Yeah. yeah. Plus the hotels in Vegas um, yeah. threw some interesting surprises at us, and it was a serious learning experience and it was a very expensive learning experience and I think it's one of the reasons that um, I know the World Horror Convention has sadly disappeared now and people would occasionally hear all these things at Stoker caught about oh you guys killed the other convention and it's like no conventions are so expensive to put on now that unless you have the resources of an organization behind you, I don't think you can do it anymore. It's changed a lot just in the time that I've been involved with them. In the past, hotels were like, oh, we'll throw in your AV and your food for yeah. free and all that. Now it's like, oh, you want a water station? That's $750. Yeah. Trash cans. Oof. Yeah. Ah, those are going to run you. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> so we learned a lot uh, from putting that first one on. And by 2017, which was held on the Queen Mary in Long Beach, um, we had really started to refine what we wanted from it. And so we started involving these sort of components. So the convention now consists of the main convention. And then we have things like Librarians Day, where librarians from all over the country come in and they have a dedicated day where they get panels and programming and learn what to put in their libraries. And um, we have the Ann Radcliffe Academic Conference. Um, we have the Horror University, which are workshops taught by people that you pay a little bit extra for and you get two hours of hands-on education with someone who knows what they're talking about. And um, I'm really, I just, I love the final frame, um, the short horror film competition. And Jonathan Lees has been overseeing that for us since 2017. And it's so fun. You go sit in a, you know, a big space and you watch 13 incredible short horror films mm -hmm. with people who love horror films. And um, he has such an incredible taste and he does such a great job of finding these films every year. And it's um, growing steadily. And I know this last one that was held a month ago in Pittsburgh was the biggest one yet. Um, it had around 600 live attendees and about 120, I think they said, virtual attendees. Oh, I thought it was meant zombies for, for the yeah. other <laughs> That's an obvious joke, but come on, I had to go for it. <laughs> you had to, and I loved that it was in Pittsburgh, where I had never been. So, yeah. yes, I did all the zombie photo ops. Um, but next year we'll be in San Diego, um, which will be nice because I get to drive to that one. And, um, I'm really, as a, a former president of HWA, who was really involved with the planning and creation of this whole thing, it's one of the things I'm actually proudest of. How did you handle the pandemic? Uh, um, did it take two years off? Basically? We did. Yeah. And I tried it coming was... back in 2020, late 21, for my pharma conference that I put on. And the hotel was like, if, as long as we have 48 hours notice, we'll refund you everything. Oh, if wow. there's a surge. And I'm like, I still can't do it. I can't pull the trigger and have everybody commit to traveling. And then there's a surge and we have to cancel. Right. Didn't happen, but it was still a... No, I, I I couldn't go through all that planning, even knowing I'd get the money back. So twenty two, we we went back to it. Uh, right, in person, that, so. same with us. We were down for for twenty 2020 twenty and twenty twenty one, and it was really sad because twenty twenty would have been our first international show. Mm. It was in the UK. We had an incredible team planning it in the UK, and. Um, you know, we we couldn't do it, and they. I felt so sorry for them because they had to put it off for two years, um, and they did not have a hotel quite as cooperative, apparently. But, <clears throat> excuse me, by the time they were put that show on, it was so far past StokerCon, they couldn't even call it that anymore. They had to call it ChillerCon. And 
Um, I was sorry I wasn't able to go, but 2021, we were more prepared for, and we knew early on that it was going to be virtual. Mm -hmm. Um, and it was, there was a time when we thought it might happen and it would be in Denver, but, um, we ended up just doing Denver in 2022 instead. A couple of of pharma trade shows in 21, but it was very, yeah, guess we're all going to be masked all the time and kind of uncomfortable in this big space. And they ended up I think one of them was in Philadelphia. They did not have a mask mandate on day one, and something changed in the state of Pennsylvania overnight. Oh, my God. And so God. day two and day three, everybody had to be masked up. I'm like, that's not a good sign. I think wow. it's best if we just all bug the heck out and go <laughs> home. And, and yeah. But it's, again, our our, our infectious zombie thing that was, that was happening to yeah, us. Yeah, right, of course. Yeah. But how's horror writing and that, that space changed over the the years you've been in it um way for the better yeah (laughs) gigantically for the better Uh, when i started trying to seriously (laughs) sell short horror fiction which was the early 90s um you could count on the fingers of maybe both hands if you looked really hard the number of women horror writers (laughs) that Mm -hmm. were out there um, I was stood in awe of people like Nancy Holder and Nancy Kilpatrick and Elizabeth Massey. And there were just so few women writing horror. And you would flip open a, a, a new anthology and see like no female names in it. And I know that it was just as bad for authors of color and for LGBTQ authors. And um, it was one of the things I worked actively to try and improve during my time as HWA's president. And so we put forth all kinds of things like scholarships dedicated to women or to authors of color and and all kinds of um, recognition programs like our monthly Sears table column that that goes out and actively seeks these authors and gives them a little bit of publicity. And um, it's been so gratifying to see that change. And it's been very rapid. Just the last 10 years, suddenly there are all these incredible new authors coming in and they're so good and their work is so exciting. And you just read it and you just kind of want to go, Oh, thank goodness it's (laughs) happening. Finally, it's not the same stuff. And excuse me, not to denigrate any, you know, white, cis hat male writers who are all incredibly gifted, but it's so nice to see the table getting shared now with people who bring these very new and distinctive voices to the table. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm used to the, in, in the comics world, I think the the real bottoming out of this was a, gosh, I forget which show it was, but they had a panel on women in comics that had five white male panelists. Yeah, right. And, and, it was one of those, yeah, I think you're kind of defeating the purpose here if you're Yeah. You're, right, exactly. You know. Yeah. But yeah, there's a either the obvious knocks on diversity, inclusion, et cetera, you know, with with oh, it's just a quota for this and that, but you really as you see with with the the book itself, when you you start bringing in all these other countries and all these other voices, and and you know the idea that South Korea would suddenly take off with with you know zombie right. flicks, it's like yeah. yeah, everybody's got these these really interesting stories to tell, and they can work on you know the existing uh, we'll say uh, like those are sort of Jungian templates for these things, but find ways of uh, yeah giving you something new. I mean, anyone who hasn't seen Train to Busan is missing out hugely. No, I know. feel terrible, but yes, <laughs> I, I mean, and I've heard of it, and it was coming across it in the book i was like yeah i really should you, I, you I need really, to... <laughs> you do need to see it it's it's one of the few times that the fast zombies thing works brilliantly yeah so yeah. i mean again i was a danny boyle fan so that was part of yeah. going to 28 days yeah. later and it was the holy crap i can't believe i'm this freaked out by you know <laughs> right running men like this but but yeah and so screenwriting just wasn't a a it was uh something i pursued actively for about 10 years. It wasn't until I had minor success at it that I realized I don't really like this. <laughs> um, I had about a half a dozen movies made, most of which are the kind of things that you will see on the sci-fi channel at four in the morning. And there were these 
there was one in particular that really broke my heart, and I'm not even going to bother to tell you which one it is, but it was a script I loved, and I actually flew to Vancouver to be on the set of this when they were shooting it because I loved the script so much, and I had no idea it bore no resemblance to anything I had written. They retained nothing but the very basic situation and, weirdly enough, the character names. It's the kind of thing where you're watching it and you're like, why did they even keep the names? Yes, There's the legal people. purposes at that point. God knows. Probably. <laughs> probably. And the movie, I had seen the script as a sort of parable of feminism. And by the time I was on the set watching them shoot it, it was the kind of thing where there was a guy coming in and telling the women what to do. And I was just, I, my significant others told me he never heard me so angry as that phone call from Vancouver after I left that <laughs> set. <laughs> so, you know, but here's this thing that your name is all over. Because you don't, as a screenwriter, you on these low budget things, you can't say take my name off this piece of shit. I'm sorry. Yes, yeah. I hope no, no, I can I'm say curse all the time on the show. Okay, so. okay. good. <laughs> Yay. Um, and I, I was not proud of these things, and and sometimes I would make the mistake of involving myself in the production beyond screenwriting. Yeah. Um, there was a terrible children's movie called Adventures in Dinosaur City that I worked on for a year. Um, in a variety of capacities. And even at the time it was in production, I was watching it just falling apart and thinking, you know, and it's, it's one of those things where you think, well, maybe I can still save it. And you, you're finally, you find yourself in the editing room after production and the movie had two editors. And the second one was a guy who was very, very good, who, was skilled at doing that kind of thing where you'd be like, okay, look, that guy's back is to the camera right now. We can dub in a line for him. <laughs> yeah. And this was how we were trying to save this movie. And, you know, and, it, and then you finally see the finished thing and you're like, why did I even try to save it? It was bad from day <laughs> one. And, and, and my name is in that movie five times because I got five credits on it. Oh, <laughs> and my, my ultimate horror story about that was when I finally showed this movie to my mother and my, we get to the end of it, and she watches all the credits, and she's quiet. And then, it, you know, I turn it off, and she says, oh, Lisey, that movie was really bad. And I go, yeah, I, I know. I just, you know, I couldn't fix it. And she says, well, why not? Your name's on it five times. And you're just like, <laughs> give me the gun now. I, um, so by the time that stuff was all kind of past me, I realized, you know, I want something I can be proud of that has my name on it that I can point to and go, yeah, that's that's actually what I care about. And um, I had done some small theater where I had gotten to know Dennis Etchison, and I knew him through friends anyways. And um, I toyed for a bit with small theater, but then realized I should be writing fiction. And I was very fortunate to have people like Dennis and Steve Jones, who's the editor that I have worked with the most, um, look at the fiction and just say right off the bat, either you can sell this or I will buy this. And it was kind of like coming home at that point. It's like, yeah, this is where I should have been all along. Mm -hmm. yeah, you found your route, much like a zombie finding its way to, to human <laughs> yes, brains. <but> indeed. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the last thing I, I usually ask people, um, and I should have warned you this was coming. What are you reading? What am I reading? I am always reading research stuff. Yeah. It's um, I don't get nearly the time for pleasure reading that I wish I had. But um, right now, I am in a very weird research thing. I have fallen down one of those rabbit holes where uh -huh. I am working on the introduction to a new edition of Phantasmagoriana. And I would love it if your readers knew what that was. I don't know what that is. I, very I to... few people know what that is, and it's something that has interested me for years. Phantasmagoriana is the collection of ghost stories that Mary Shelley and yeah. Percy and Lord Byron and John Polidori read to each other that inspired her to write Frankenstein and Polidori to write The Vampire. And um, it is a collection originally of eight ghost stories. It was translated from German into French. And then um, a, this is 18, 
2012, I think, is that edition. And then a year later, um, a British matron essentially named Sarah Utterson translates six of the stories into English and releases it, self-publishes it, under the title Tales of the Dead. And she adds one extra story that she likes and then a little fragment of a story by herself. And um, those original stories out of Phantasmagoriana are remarkable, and two of them are almost unknown. Um, So uh, Eric Gennard, who is a fabulous author and editor and has his own small press, is doing the ultimate version of Phantasmagoriana. He is doing both the Utterson edition with the six tales, and then he is doing the original Phantasmagoriana with all eight, and he has had new translations done. And um, he's also assembling this with a list of um, a published a bibliography and showing where all of these things came from. And um, I have always, like I said, have been long interested in Phantasmagoriana. It, it absolutely astonishes me that this has to be one of the most important books in history and yeah. no one knows of it. And it's been impossible to find for many years. You can find the Utterson translation, Tales of the Dead, online for free. And um, But there's the rabbit hole I have fallen down is that one of the stories she did not use is um, a very interesting piece called The Grey Chamber. And it's very different. She she liked the stories that were sentimental and uh, very long and have that kind of bloated 19th, 18th century, I should say, prose about them that are tinged with romance and gothicism and supernatural happenings. The Great Chamber, I I can understand why she didn't use it. It wouldn't have appealed to her because it's very terse and concise, and it's a classic short, sharp shock. It is still very powerful, I think. And I am fairly sure that it was also a huge inspiration on Sir Walter Scott. Mm-hmm. for his 1828 story, The Tapestry Chamber. So this is my current rabbit hole is trying to <laughs> dig out. Could Scott have also known of this story? And it's normally credited with being the one that most inspired Mary Shelley. And you can find passages in Frankenstein that sound a lot yeah. like The Great Chamber. So my current thing is like trying to figure out if it's possible that this one story by a German author could have inspired two of the most famous works of horror fiction of all time. So I, I spent yesterday at the uh, yesterday evening uh Henry Wessels was doing one of the readings and uh expounded on his theory that uh Lovecraft had been reading Moby Dick and that's where the mythos comes from. Interesting. Okay. Specifically that that Cthulhu as we'll pronounce it uh he does not pronounce it the same way. Um is the love child of Ahab and Moby Dick. Uh, it's an interesting <laughs> essay that he, he, oh. he read and, and performed for us. But uh, yeah, so that idea of the, the sort of literary antecedents like that and, and, you know, the sense of provenance, I guess, you know, who actually got to see what and, yes. and you know, how it touches on them. He actually had to go to the uh, uh, an antiquarian museum in Worcester to, to make sure he found Lovecraft's copy of Melville ah, uh, because wow. he thought the dates matched up and he just he had to hold it in his hand and, and make sure he didn't trust the, the museum itself. So, yeah, it's uh, <laughs> we're weird people, I guess. That's, that's <laughs> Indeed we are. I'm reading that. And then, of course, I, I am always reading something to blurb for someone or to yeah. uh, write an introduction for. And there is a the other thing that I'm currently reading is a forthcoming collection of uh, short stories, all set in and by New Zealand authors. Mm -hmm. Um, And even though I am not a Kiwi, um, I have been blessed with being asked to write the introduction for this. And um, so I am reading that, and it's a really good collection. So look forward to it. Now that Kate Mariama has connected us, I I look forward to seeing your name (laughs) show up. And coincidentally, it'll start cropping up in every goddamn thing that I'm I'm reading now. And and, I I am in a lot of things, I have to confess. Awesome. I look forward to it. Lisa, thanks so much for for coming on the show. And I know people will be hearing this three months after, but have a great reader con. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm enjoying it uh, very much so far. It's my first one.
And that was Lisa Morton. Go check out her new book, The Art of the Zombie Movie, from Applause Books. It's a really fun book. It's, well, it's got a ton of great art, lots of good essays and, and captions, lots of good prose from Lisa, a deep love of zombie movies, and, you know, a really great presentation in the process. Also, go check out Lisa's site, lisamorton.com, L-I-S-A-M-O-R-T-O-N, uh, for more on her writing, her, her paranormal explorations, which we didn't even get into, uh, her great photo albums, and, and more. She's on Instagram as Lisa Morton in LA. Uh, she has a sub stack at Lisa Morton, all one word. And well, I'll have links to all of that in the show and episode notes for this one. Although I will note that her site has a lot of other routes to check out her work, uh, like Facebook, Flickr, which I use and didn't think anybody else used, uh, YouTube, Pinterest, and more. So I'll send you to that. You can find all sorts of ways to follow Lisa and her work. They can support the Virtual Memories show by telling other people about it. Let them know there's this neat podcast comes out every week with really fascinating conversations with interesting creative people. You can also help out the show by telling me what you like and don't like about it and who you'd like to hear me record with or what movie or TV show or book or piece of music or theater or art exhibition or zombie movie you think I should turn listeners on to. You can do that by sending me an email, uh, DMing me if we're connected on social media, uh, sending me a postcard or a letter. My mailing address is at the bottom of the, the sub stack I put out every week, twice a week now, um, or by calling my Google voice number and leaving me a message. And that's 973-869-9659. That goes directly to voicemail, so you don't have to worry about getting stuck in an awkward conversation with me. And messages can be up to three minutes long. If you go longer than that, you'll get cut off. Just call back and leave another message. And let me know if it would be okay to include your message in an upcoming episode of the show. You might have something interesting to share with listeners, but I would never run something like that without the speaker's permission. So uh, let me know. Now, if you've got money to spare, don't give it to me. I mean, at the very beginning of this, I sort of talked about my work and the, the resources it, it provides me. Um, shows like this one where I went to ReaderCon for two days, you know, that's, that's gas, hotel, tolls, all that stuff, you know. Part of it's to do the show. I also recorded with Christopher Brown while I was there. Part of it is just to see friends and, and meet new people and find new books. And, you know, so, you know, it's not directly a podcast equals this amount of money. What I'm saying is you can support the show if you want by uh, subscribing to the Substack that I do or uh, doing the paid tier for that or our Patreon. But really give money to other people, give money to, to institutions in, in need. You can find people through GoFundMe and Kickstarter and, and Indiegogo and Patreon and Crowdfunder and all those other crowdfunding platforms. Uh, or there are people who are going to need um, money for rent or for vet bills, medical bills, getting an artistic project off the ground, and you know, all sorts of stuff. And when it comes to, to institutions, I give to my local food bank every month. And I also make contributions to different charities and, and foundations like the, the Poor People's Campaign, uh, Planned Parenthood, Women's Choice Funds. I make targeted election contributions because I'm a lobbyist and that's part of my job. But there are all sorts of things you can do to, to try to help build a better world. So um, I hope you will. Our music for this episode is Fella by Hal Mayforth. Use with permission from the artist. You should visit my archives to check out my episode with Hal from the summer of 2018 and learn more about his art and painting. And you can listen to his music at soundcloud.com slash Mayforth. And that's M-A-Y, the number four, T-H. And that's it for this week's episode of the Virtual Memories Show. Thanks so much for listening. We'll be back next week with another great conversation. You can subscribe to the Virtual Memories Show and download past episodes at the iTunes Store. You can also find all our episodes and get on our email list at either of our websites, vmspod.com or chimeraobscura.com slash vm. You can also follow the Virtual Memories Show on Twitter and Instagram at vmspod, at virtualmemoriespodcast.tumblr.com, and on YouTube, Spotify, and TuneIn.com by searching for Virtual Memories Show. And if you like this podcast, please tell your pals, talk it up on social media, and go to iTunes, look up the Virtual Memories Show, and leave a rating and maybe a review for us. 
It all goes to helping us build a bigger audience. You've been listening to the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth. Keep reading, keep making art, and keep the conversation going. 